hey there folks, here at the Raymond Alf Museum in Claremont, California, here for Fossil Fest, so uh, let's see what they got. Got anything to say to the fans out there? Got anything to say to the fans. This is all the, three of them? All three of them. Fantastic museum, you need to come see us. We are world famous. We have the largest collection of trace fossils in the United States in North America, and um, we are the only uh, museum on a high school campus in North America. So, great place. We renovate April 29th through October and then we have grand opening. It is going to be very grand. And uh, what do you do here at the museum, Karen? I am a, an assistant to the director of education at the museum. Pretty important job, huh? Folding things and giving <laughs> tours and helping out. Well, con <laughs> considering museums run on volunteers, I'd say every little bit helps. Every little bit does help. That's exactly true. So let that be a lesson. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, let that be a lesson. Um, support your local museum. There you go. Good. For all you high school students, it's a great way to earn community service. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. All right, let's go see what else they got going on at Fossil Fest. Fun things around the corner. All right, Watch thank you. Way. So what we got going on here? Um, we're actually making fossils. Mm -hmm. And what you're going to do is you're going to have them write their names on this. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to pick um, their own mold and they're going to take it that station and they're gonna fill it up mm -hmm. and then you're gonna wait for it to dry and then come back and see your mold. Okay, smile, you're on a crappy web series. <laughs> Hi. Hi. All right, you know, after finding that deer track way last week, I think I'll give this a shot. What do you got? Um, well, there's a deer, a mountain lion, a pig, an otter. These are both otters. Mm -hmm. um, a bird. These are trilobites and these are old um, plants that the museum actually found to make molds of themselves. And this is a squirrel. A squirrel. And huh? then this is a mouse. So. And it looks like a little sea otter. And you get to choose between them. I think we'll go with the sea otter. Never okay. seen someone try to make a print of a sea otter before. Can you write your name on the table? Absolutely. All right, so we'll go get that checked out. All right, here we are at the, the plaster station here where we're going to get our little sea otter mold filled. This is usually how they make uh, cast of tracks in the field, except usually the footprint is in the ground, not in a little rubber mold. I've never seen anyone try to make a sea otter print before, probably because they don't often leave them. Mm -hmm. Enjoying getting your hands dirty? Absolutely. Ah. Head it over here. All in the name of science, as the Mythbusters would probably say. Yes. And then we'll stick it right here. Just stick your name tag beneath it. Come back in probably 40 minutes. All right, thank you. Smile, you're on a crappy web series. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, let's go check out what's inside. As you can see here, these are reptile tracks from Arizona. Also, as Karen noted, they're very famous for their footprints. In the Grand Canyon, yeah. There's little fossils from Ediacara. Ediacara is some of the earliest traces of multicellular life known. Mm -hmm. There's a cast of a giant trilobite, Isotelus rex, the biggest trilobite ever found. Huge. You can see a lot of bare space actually as they're getting ready to renovate. Um, interesting thing you know, to note here you know, is this sort of this big hole with these walls built up around it. Sorry. This wall with holes built up around it. So if we go over here, there doesn't seem to be a hole, at least in the same spot. There's another one. Uh, these could be what are known as pathologies, and that is basically something that's happened to the bone. It could be disease, it could be a fight with another dinosaur, most likely another Allosaurus, probably less likely, but probably likely is a fight with a Stegosaurus, as Allosaur bones have been found with wounds matching the, the tail spike of Stegosaurus. All right, here we see a Titanothere bone bed, you know, collected in Western Nebraska in the 1960s. Uh, these sort of boneyards have been found. I mean, there's many 
many boneyards for different species. And apparently this one is displayed exactly how they found it. In fact, when someone disobeys the sign and does touch, they have to go out and get a bunch of old photographs so they can put everything, put it back in place. Loads of stuff here. All right, here's a little something special here. As you can see, sorry. There we go, that is a cast of the peccary skull that basically started this whole museum. So, uh, Alf was out fossil hunting with a couple of his buddies in Barstow, and they came across this skull of an extinct animal called a peccary. It's a pig-like animal, but not really a pig. It turned out to be a new species, and that, that lit a fire in Alf's belly. He spent the rest of his life teaching paleontology and looking for fossils and hence the museum's named after him. Which is what I hope to do someday, open my own museum. I know it has a snowball's chance in hell of happening, but you know, you gotta try. All right, here's that camel. You know, that, was, that I mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago. Um, this camel's found out in Barstow by the museum in uh, 2005. Skeletons like this are very rare. I mean, well, complete skeletons are extremely rare, let alone complete articulated skeletons. Articulated means it's in the same... The bones are in the same position as when the animal was alive. This specimen, as you can see, quite well preserved. He's even got the little toes there preserved. And yet this camel presents a bit of a paradox. He was obviously buried quickly, as evidenced by, you know, the fine-grained silt. But, he's articulated. You know, all the little bones are still in place. You know, his bones usually wash away in a high, high action environment like this. And as you can see, the curtain is also powerful enough to twist the neck under the, sh under the shoulders. Unfortunately, the museum got there about 10 years too late. The skull had eroded away. It means they can't get a precise identification, but I mean, when you got this much material, you think they could at least get it down to the genus. Um, all right, here's another interesting specimen here at the Elf Museum. Uh, this dinosaur was even, even made the national news way back in, I think, 2007. It was when this guy was announced. You know, I first heard about it on uh, National Geographic News. That's how big it was. This is the skull of Gryposaurus monumentensis, you know, a new species found by the museum in southern Utah at Grand Staircase Escalante. And as you can see, it's, it's a little rough around the edges, but it is still a beautiful skull. I mean, here, look at the tooth battery on this, on this guy. Nice, beautiful tooth battery. And you see he's got the eye socket, and it's a little, you know, on the exposed side, as you can see, it's not as good, but this side is fantastic. You can even see the base where keratin that formed the animal's beak, you know, why we call them duckbills. You can even see that on it. And, lastly, uh, let's see, you can see kind of how big this thing is. It is like, yeah, it's big. <laughs> like, as you can see, my hand fits in just its eye socket. And uh, speaking of hadrosaurs, this is um, another one of the museum's uh, prized specimens. This is a partial hadrosaur skeleton that they found in the Hell Creek Formation of Montana. It's about 65, 66 million years old. And it consisted of a mostly complete leg, you know, um, a partially articulated tail, plus um, lots of additional loose vertebra. And most excitingly, you see, they found a skin impression from this animal. Yeah, you know, because soft tissue almost never fossilizes. Only, you know, hard bones and teeth survive long enough to become fossils, but very rarely you get soft tissue preservation. That's why that, that little hunk of rock with the lumps is so important, because it actually tells us something about the appearance of the animal, what it looked like in life. And because, you know, last year it was announced that they even found a way to uh, figure out the color of at least feathered dinosaurs. Very exciting stuff. And then uh, Karen informed me that they're 
They're gonna recreate this animal's dig site in the new museum. And you can see that's basically what it looked like in the ground. That's what you can expect the dig site to look like, recreate a dig site here in the museum, which we'll see in the fall. And here's the most interesting specimen, a cast of a giant alligator skull from South America. Uh, this guy, here, let's give you a good little crane shot there. <sighs> All right, did you see that? This is an animal called Purusaurus, lived during the late Miocene, about seven million years ago, in the Puru Basin of South America. As you can see, it, the skull looks very much like a modern-day alligator, except only bordering on the size of Godzilla. <laughs> and as you can see, like a an alligator, like a true alligator, it's got these you know real pointed teeth up front for grabbing stuff, and you can even see in the back smaller teeth for crushing stuff because alligators outright crush their prey. That's what they specialize in. And then you can see all these little bumps and holes. Basically, alligators, on their head at least, don't have anything between the skin and the bone. The skin is just directly grafted to the bone. And, that's why, and that gives their skull this characteristic, you know, motley appearance. Um, essentially, they think that this may have been one of the biggest predators to walk the Earth. Probably at least in the Cenozoic. They think it's something like, like 40 feet long, 12 tons in weight, based on measurements of the skull. And um, you think alligators in Florida are bad. Imagine finding this thing in your pool, assuming you had a pool that could fit it. God, you need like an Olympic pool. All right, here we are in the, the fossil prep lab. So you don't have a hand here we got like a small little bone, like from a much smaller animal. Or depending if the end is used, could be a juvenile. There's a little unopened cast. Big old mastodon. Thank you. It's a big old mastodon jaw. So we start over here. This is a good place to start. If you just came in, you want to start over here. There we go. This is uh. You guys want to come over here? Let's we'll start over here. Mm -hmm. So what you got in the cast? Well, when we collect fossils in the field, we wrap them in plaster to get them back in one piece. Mm -hmm. So we found something and we thought it was good enough that we dug it out and we wrapped it up in plaster. And when we bring it back, it's all nice, nice and safe. So then when we're ready to work on it, we'll cut it open with a saw and we'll lift this off. And then we'll work on the fossil. See, this is a skull. you got two rows of teeth, back of the skull, front of the skull. It's the same animal as that. Oreodon. You get that from South Dakota? This is from Nebraska. Ah. Anyway, um, they're quite common, this type of animal. It take a long time to dig all the rock out and keep this together, prep it. And sometimes the fossils are in really hard rock, like this is from Barstow, found by a student last, time, last fall. A little mess on jello. really hard. So what we use is called an air scrag. Mm -hmm. A little like bitty little mammoth jaw. Look at those little baby teeth. Look at that. It's a mastodon jaw so from Barstow. Like Here's a mastodon skull from Barstow. This big old really gonk here as we saw in Dr. Farkey's uh, lecture. Yeah. Like a little crane like shot. Very noisy. Unlike this is a 